Good evening, everyone. I'm just trying to see if we are connected online. Everyone online, our oh, thumbs up. That's fantastic. Let us open in a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you that we can gather here today. Thank you that you have been speaking to us in such marvelous and wonderful and unusual ways through this learning about Revelation. We pray that tonight we would have open minds, uh, that we would have honest conversations, that we would discover something more of your heart as we read the next uh, two chapters in Revelation. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. So welcome everybody, so good to see you again. Um, we're going to get in Involved with Revelation chapter 14 and 15 tonight. So I don't know if you want to turn there with me in your Bible so long. Uh, Revelation 14 and 15. We're going to take it over four parts. So we're going to break it up into four different sections tonight, and we're going to look at each one. Uh, just a warning. <laughs> we, I'm trying to get Revelation done quickly now over the next couple of weeks, so we're going to work fast and hard. <laughs> so yeah, just a little bit of a warning. Uh, but if it's, if it's too much, just tell me. Okay, yeah, let me know, because I'll, I'll just keep going, and you'll all be sleeping, and it's not a nice thing. Okay, so we're going to start with Revelation chapter 14, uh, from verse 1 through to verse 5. This is our first section for the night, so four sections. This is the first section. It speaks about the Lamb and the 144,000. Now, we know who the Lamb is by now, hey? Who's the Lamb? Jesus. Okay, good. We know something. The 144,000, we've encountered them before. Uh, that was in uh, one of the other chapters earlier on. That was a representation of the perfect number. Remember, 12 times 12 times 1,000. So it wasn't that there were literally 144,000. It just represented the perfect amount, symbolized the perfect amount. Uh, and they were the people that are faithful to God. Okay, bear that in mind as we read from chapter 14, from verse 1 through to verse 5. Just a recap. The previous chapter was about the dragon and the two beasts and how they were trying to destroy the lamb and they couldn't and they were defeated. Okay, so this is where we're at. Then I looked... Uh, then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud appeal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song, a new song, before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except for the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as a first fruit to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Thanks be to God for his word. Can you guys remember, I don't know if any of you did this, anyone ever play King of the Castle when you were kids growing up? Uh, you know, it was that game where, for those of us who can't remember, it was the game where if there was a mount, like a, a little hill, or if there was building sand particularly, then you would try and get to the top of that hill, and your brothers or sisters or friends, they would try and overthrow you, and they would push you off the hill, and you'd push them off the hill, and it was this like wrestling match, and whoever was the last one on the hill was the king of the castle, and everyone else was the dirty rascals. Remember that game? The, this passage <laughs> tells us who the king of the castle is. The, the opening statement is all about the lamb. Then I looked, and there before me was the lamb standing on Mount Zion. What does that signify? Victory. That Jesus is the king of the castle. The dragon, the beasts, everything that they could throw at the people of God, everything that they could throw at, at Jesus, everything that they could do, 
has been defeated. Jesus is on Mount Zion. It symbolizes, remember, this is symbols and it's visions. It symbolizes that Jesus has won. The Lamb has won the victory. It also is a quote from Psalm 2, from verse 6, which says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Uh, the victory has been won. The king is on his rightful throne. That's what this whole five verses is all about, is how Jesus is on the throne. He's on Mount Zion. He is the king of the castle. But alongside him, it describes the 144,000, and it says a few things about these 144,000. Now remember, who are the 144,000? They're the faithful to God. Uh, they, are the, they represent the people of God. It's not that it was literally 144,000. It was the perfect amount of people. Uh, that's what it represented. So that's what it represented. And so we have the 144,000 are there next to Jesus on the hill uh, proclaiming victory. This passage says a few things about the 144,000. The first thing that it says, if you read there, it says they have the name of the father of him, which is the lamb, and his father's name written on their foreheads. Can you remember the previous chapter? What was happening to the people with the beast? They were getting the beast's number written on their foreheads or on their hands, and it was a way of knowing who was worshipping the Roman uh, gods and who was not worshipping the Roman emperors as God. Here it says that the 144,000 had the name of God and the name of Jesus written on their forehead. Now, what exactly does that symbolize? The first thing it symbolizes is um, ownership. We know it when a cattle when cattle are branded. You guys know about that, right? Then there's a certain number that's branded on the cattle. It signifies uh, ownership. Uh, slaves, by the way, were also branded, so people could tell who the slaves belonged to. So to say that the name of the lamb and the name of the, his father is on the forehead means that they belong to the father and to the lamb. It also signified loyalty. Apparently, soldiers in those days would sometimes brand their hand with the name of the general uh, whom he loved and would follow into battle. I think of modern day when someone has the tattoo <laughs> of a loved one. <laughs> Have you ever seen those tattoos and then when they break up, they change it into something new? <laughs> it signifies loyalty, that I'm loyal to you. Uh, security. There was a, a strange story about a father and his son. Uh, the father was Apollo. And they were in, in very dangerous times. And, and a letter was discovered in, I think it was the 3rd or the 4th century, where the f son was writing to the father saying that I wish I could brand your body so that if something happens to you, I would be able to find you. Uh, so it was this idea of security that if you were branded then people would know who you belong to, and then you could have this sense of security. It was also about dependence. Uh, dependence. I, I didn't know this, but the great Arab chieftains had their humble clients who were absolutely dependent on them, and the sheik would often brand them with the same mark as he used to brand his camels to show that they were dependent on him. Uh, so in other words, if you had that brand, then the sheik would look after you. Uh, you could come there and he would make sure that you had everything you needed because you carried the same brand as his camel. <laughs> that is shocking. But that, that was what the people lived with. So they knew that if you have the brand, it means that you belong to somebody. It means that you're loyal to that person. It means that's their security because everyone knows who you belong to. Uh, it meant that there was dependence so you could go to the person who owned your brand and they would look after you. And it was also a sense of safety. Um, it was a sense of safety. If you had the name of a certain person on their forehead or branded, you wouldn't mess with them. It reminds me of a friend of mine who, she was out at a pub and 
She was having an argument with a guy. A guy was giving her hassles, and she was trying to get rid of him, and he wasn't listening. And then she turned around. It was quite a small town. It's, it's from the East Rand. I won't mention which town. But a lot of people know her family. And so she said to the guy, do you know who my father is? And this guy said, no. And she was like, most people in this town know who my dad is. And he was like, well, should I be scared? And she says, well, he does bury people for a living. He's one of the ministers that work there. <laughs> but the guy didn't know, so he left her alone. <laughs> but uh, because of who her father was, he was like, okay, now I'm going to leave you alone, thinking he's some kind of gangster. But anyway, so it, it was a sense of safety. So when this passage speaks about the 144,000 having the brand of Jesus and the brand of God on their forehead, it's the exact opposite of the mark of the beast. It shows who they belong to. The second thing that it speaks about in the 144,000 is it says that they were singing a new song. When do we generally sing? When we're happy. Sometimes when you're sad, then you'll sing like a mournful song. But here they're singing a new song, and it describes the song as one that says that nobody could learn that song other than the 144,000. Only these people would be able to sing the song. Why? <laughs> There's a, a thing in humanity that you will never fully understand something unless you've been through it. Isn't that true? You will never understand something unless you've actually experienced it. Often we can, we can feel for someone and we can imagine what it is like, but unless we ourselves have been through the same situation, we do not understand it. These 144,000 are the ones who have been faithful to God right through to the end. They are the ones that have faced all sorts of persecution, trials, temptations, and they've remained faithful. And now they are in the throne room with God. And so they're able to sing uh, this new song. Um, this is what William Barclay says, To learn certain things, a man must be a certain kind of person. The Lamb's company were able to learn the new song because they had passed through certain experiences. They had suffered. Uh, there are certain things which only sorrow can teach. And so the 144,000 represent the martyrs who've been through what the Lamb went through. They lay down their lives. They picked up their cross they followed Jesus right through to the end, and so they could sing this new song that for those who are faithful will one day be able to sing it as well. The third thing that this passage mentions about the 144,000 is um, very weird. I don't know if anyone picked that one up. Uh, which one is it? Any guesses? They were all virgins. That one stumped me at first. I was like, why does it have to? Uh, that actually sounds like something from a different religion. Uh, this whole, you know, the elite few that make it into the throne room. So I was doing some research on it and trying to figure out, like, what does it mean? Remember, Revelation is all about symbolism. Revelation is all about symbolism. And it's often taken from the Old Testament. So this passage says the 144,000... Uh, they were not defiled by, with women, for they kept themselves pure. So think back on the Old Testament. Was there ever a story about um, men, particularly, who were not defiled by women at a certain point? In other words, they'd had no sexual relations at a certain point. The answer is 1 Samuel 21 with David. David was running away from Saul. I don't know if you remember the story. David is running away from Saul. He's running for his life. He has a few of his men with him. And they get to the priests of Nob. And he is very hungry. His men are starving. And the priest there says, the only bread I have is the shoe bread, the show bread, like the, the sacred bread. He says, I cannot give it to you unless you guys have been kept clean. In other words, you haven't had any sexual relations over the last while. And David turns around and says to him, we're at war, we're in a battle 
which means that my men would never have slept with a woman. There was this concept that war was holy in ancient Israel. Uh, it's still there. Isn't it, isn't it still there today? That concept that, ho that there's this holy war that people speak about? And so the idea was because war is holy, uh, because God is part of this war, the concept, the idea was that the people themselves needed to be holy. In other words, they must make sure that they're clean. One of the ways in which they would remain holy is by refraining from any sexual interactions. That meant that they were then ready for war. They were ready for war. Uh, I think in some sports they actually do that as well, by the way. So anyway, when it speaks about this 144,000 uh, not partaking, not being defiled, or being virgins, it means that they are permanently ready for battle. That's what it symbolizes. They're permanently ready for battle. In other words, at any point, if the call comes, they are ready for battle. Remember, this is a victory poem. This is, this is telling the story of how Jesus has won the war. He's standing on Mount Zion. He has been victorious. Alongside him is the 144,000 people who have been permanently ready for battle. They are always ready. You cannot win, lose a war if your soldiers are always ready for battle. That's what it's, it's pointing out. It's a reminder for us uh, that we should also always be ready to serve God in every circumstance. Is this making sense? Am I going too fast? Okay, great. The last thing about these 144,000 is not only did they learn a new song, not only did they have the name of Jesus and the Father on their foreheads, uh, not only were they kept pure, uh, but one more thing that it says is they follow the Lamb wherever He goes, and they were purchased among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No, when I was found in their mouths, they are blameless. What does first fruits imply? Best. So, so they are the top. They are the top ones. They the, they the ones that came first. They are the best. Uh, it also f signifies that they're not the last. You know, it doesn't say they were the only fruit. It just says that they're the first fruits. In other words, there are still people to come who will endure many things, who are always ready for battle, that are faithful to God. They're just the first fruits. They're not the only fruit. Uh, just remember that. I'm so glad that sunk in your head immediately. You know, we always think first fruits. First fruits also means that there's still fruit to come. Uh, this is not the end. Hey. Any thoughts, comments, questions so far? Um, Louise, is that why Uriah the Hittite actually didn't sleep with his wife because he had to go back to the battlefield? That is exactly why, yes, thank you. So Uriah the Hittite was trying to remain pure. That's why he didn't sleep with Bathsheba every time David tried to make sure that he was seduced into doing it. That is 100% correct, yes. Thank you. Okay. Everyone with me? So that's the first part of Revelation chapter 14. It's this image of Jesus being the king of the castle. He's standing on Mount Zion. He's surrounded by his 144,000. They're busy singing a victory song because they've endured so much and they've remained faithful. They have the name of God written on them. In other words, they belong to God. They are looked after by God. Um, they are always ready to serve. And they're not the last. They're simply the first fruits. Uh, the second thing that happens is this. It's the story of the three angels. So will you turn with me as we read Revelation chapter 14 from verse 6 through to verse 13. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, 
Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image, or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the name in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Phew. <laughs> so what do we see here? Three angels, right? Three is the perfect number. Remember, it's, it's God's number, seven. It's always seven and three. So seven is God's number. Three is, uh, signifies Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let's look at each angel. We're going to just unpack each angel to see if there's anything that stands out for us. Uh, the first angel uh, seems quite nice. It, it looks pretty okay. Then I saw an angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth and to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So that's the first angel. What's he doing? He's, he's going over all of the earth, every nation, every language, every tribe, every person. And he's proclaiming, saying, give glory to God. The hour of God's judgment is here. And remember that God is the creator of all. The thing that stands out for me there is how inclusive it is. This angel is not just going to the people of God, not just going to one nation, not just going to one group. It's to every person. He's there over all of creation. It's just this inclusive call for people and creation to turn to God. Okay. That one's pretty okay. Do you agree with that one? Seems all right. The second angel, however, gives me nightmares. This is what the second angel Oh, no, this, not the second, the third. Sorry, the second one's also okay. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Why on earth is John speaking about Babylon in the time of Rome? It's an analogy. He can't speak about Rome. Let's think about it. He's in prison. Uh, he is in prison because he's not faithful to Rome. They're watching him. He's under God, not in prison, but in, on an island under arrest. Uh, they're watching him. They're reading everything he's sending out and everything that's coming to him, all his correspondence. They're examining it. He cannot say that Rome is about to fall because Rome <laughs> will not like it if someone says that Rome is about to fall. And so what he does is he has to use an analogy that the people reading it would understand. So he says, Babylon is fallen. In other words, that with this victory of Jesus, Babylon is fallen. In other words, Rome is crumbling. Rome is falling. There will come a time after people have been martyred, that will happen. There will be suffering. But there will come a time where Rome loses its power. Babylon is fallen. Why do they use Babylon? They use Babylon because in Israelite history up to that point, the one nation that had caused the most damage and treated people the worst were the Babylonians. They were the ones who destroyed the temple. They were the ones that took everyone into exile. So the Babylonians, Babylon, signified this absolute horrendous nation who destroyed 
uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And that's what Rome is doing, and that's what Rome has done. Rome has destroyed the new temple in 70 AD. This is written about 90 AD or after. So Rome has already destroyed the temple, and so Rome and Babylon signify each other. It would kind of be like today if I had to speak about the Nazis. Uh, That would be how the Israelites felt about Babylon. Uh, that they were a people that tried to destroy them. So now when people try to destroy Israelites or, or the Jews, they speak about it as this anti-Semitic, this, this Hitler way of life, this Nazi way of life. And so that's what he was doing. He was describing Babylon, uh, or Rome using Babylon. Make sense? He then says... <laughs> That Babylon made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Man, that's quite a hectic statement, isn't it? That's saying that Rome has caused everyone to go mad. Rome has has caused everyone to go mad. It's such a vivid description. Essentially, what John is using, what the visions is using for John, or describing for John, is this. Is it saying that they got them so drunk that they couldn't give in to the temptations of an adulteress. Now, that's not literal, (laughs) but what is it meaning? It's meaning that Rome seduced the people with their way of life. The Greeks did the same. The Roman way of life was also very, um, (laughs) how do I put it, rough. (laughs) It was rough. It was seductive. They used all these different tricks to try and get people to buy into the way of Rome. And it was this way in which it says that the nations, it's almost like they got them drunk so that they couldn't resist the temptation of Rome. Um, That's the description of it. And so it's just describing how absolutely immoral, that's the word I was looking for, how immoral Rome was and how many people had fallen for the way of Rome. So that's the second angel. The third angel is the one that gives me nightmares. This is what the third angel proclaims. Now remember, these are, these are, these are visions that John's getting uh, after he's described how the beast and the dragon's trying to destroy the Son of Man and the people and the church. And now he's saying that Jesus is on the throne. He's on Mount Zion. He has won the victory. Uh, now the angels are going out, and this is what they're proclaiming after the victory. They're saying everyone should give glory to God. They're saying that Rome has fallen. And then this is what the third angel says. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. Uh, he will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast in his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Sure. So it speaks about those who worship the beast are to be punished. They will face the consequences. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first read that passage, I think to myself, that is so harsh. Like, that doesn't sound like the good news of the gospel, does it? Do you agree? But, but what, is, what is it trying to say? The passage is saying, therefore, those who are there, the faithful, must have patience and endurance. What does that mean? I want you to put yourselves in the shoes, or try, and put yourselves in the shoes of the people that John was writing to. Think of some of the stories we've heard over the last, I don't even know how many weeks it is, or how many weeks it's been. Think of the story we heard two weeks ago about how Nero would have animal skins sewn into people and then allow the wild animals to chase them. Imagine that was you or your friend or worse, your partner or even worse, one of your children. And that's what you're facing. 
Imagine watching someone you loved get boiled alive, skinned, dipped in hot oil, crucified, burnt alive. That's what these people were witnessing all the time. That's what they were facing. You can imagine that there's a part of them that's going, when will justice happen? Like, when is somebody going to pay for what is going on? And this angel is almost saying, you guys just endure because God is going to put everything right. God is going to put everything right. Now, I, I would like to think that I'm hoping it's not going to involve all this ter torment and sulfur and eternal burning. Like, that for me is very, very harsh. But I think I might wish that on someone who did those things to someone I loved. Um, but it's interesting because what this angel is saying is that God is going to take care of it. So all you have to do is endure it. You don't have to take matters into your own hands. You don't have to judge. You don't have to be the one that dishes out the punishments on those who you think are out of line. Don't worry about it. God will make sure that at the end, everything is right. And people will get what's coming to them. <laughs> he then goes on and says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. In other words, if you're able to endure all of these things and remain faithful at the end, even if you die, you'll actually be blessed. You guys still with me? Are these angels scary? A little bit. A little bit scary for me. Um, but I think the bottom line is what this passage is saying is that we are not the judge. And at the end of the day, God is going to take care of it. Um, and that was good news for the people that were suffering the kind of things that they were suffering. Okay, we're going to move on. to the harvest of the earth. So this is probably my favorite passage of tonight. Uh, chapter 14, from verse 14 through to verse 20. I want you to, as we read it, I want you to think to yourself, how do you feel about this? This is now not a thinking question. This is a feeling question. When we read it, think to yourself, how do I feel about this passage? Okay, so just... From verse 14. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, that's Jesus, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel, who had charge of the fire, came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Tape your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes of the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. Or ripe. <laughs> the angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered the grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. That's about 300 kilometers. How does that passage make you feel? Horrified. Scared? I felt a little bit scared when I read that. I was like, my word, I wouldn't want to be on earth when it's harvest time. Did anyone else feel like that? I did. So my parents and my grandparents often tell me stories. Uh, we, we are a big storytelling family. But they often tell me stories 
uh, that nowadays freak me out. So for example, my parents would get on their bicycles as youngsters and they would ride to the mines or they would ride to the felt and they would spend the whole day in the felt, just a group of kids. And when it started getting dark, they would get on their bicycles and they would ride home. Isn't that true? Who used to do that? Jeez. Think today, if I had to say to you that your child or your grandchild got on their bicycle here in South Africa, got on their bicycle and rode to the mine or the felt and spent the whole day out there, how would you feel? Hell no. <laughs> There's no way. But when my parents speak about it and my grandparents speak about it, there was the sense of joy and, and like freedom and they loved it, didn't you? You guys are the ones that did that, most of you. And it was, it's great. So when you speak about it now, what feelings emerge is, is happiness and joy. But, but for people today, children today in South Africa, wouldn't have the same feeling if they were told that you drive into the, or you ride your bicycle into the felt and spend the day there. They wouldn't have the same feeling attached <laughs> to that scenario as what people from the older generations do. <laughs> Someone's growling at me. <laughs> So where am I getting at with this? We've never grown up, maybe some of you have, I don't know, but I personally have never grown up in an agricultural era. So, so in the time of Jesus and in the time of John, in that first century uh, after Jesus, in, just before Jesus as well, it was an agricultural era. Everything revolved around agriculture. Isn't that true? So all the seasons, it was about now is the season to plant, now is the season to harvest, now is the season to plow. It was all about the agriculture. The whole life of everybody revolved around agriculture because it was an agricultural era. We're now in the era of technology. That was the era of agriculture. Everything revolved around agriculture. Debts would revolve around agriculture. You could run a tab, I'm imagining, all the way through until the time of harvest because then everyone knew that's when you're going to get paid is after the farmers have harvested their fields. Religious festivals went around the time of harvest. It went around agriculture. So there were certain religious festivals which were attached to the different seasons of agriculture. Do you see what I'm getting at with this? Everything revolved around agriculture. So when somebody described it was a season of planting, everyone knew that what were emotions were attached to that. It would be this high work. It would be demand. It would be scary. It would be this uncertainty. So when people spoke about harvest, think about the feelings that went with it. Harvest time would have been the best time of the year. Isn't that true? They had their best festivals over harvest times. They would uh, drink some wine in celebration. They would gather for meals. There would be feasts. There would be religious celebrations all over the place. Everyone would gather. They would go to different farms and they would harvest together. Uh, that's when your debts were paid. That's when you'd get paid. <laughs> like, it was one gigantic celebration. That was harvest. So when the people in John's time read that there is a harvest time, the feelings associated with it is not fear. We fear a sharp sickle. <laughs> it would have been joy, excitement, because the harvest was the best time of year. Make sense? 
So now John is saying to these people who've been through so much, they've been through so much torture and torment and they've been isolated and they've been through all this stuff. And it says to them, don't worry, the time is coming, the earth is ripe, the harvest is ready when Jesus is going to harvest the earth. That is a good thing, not a bad it means that the time of everything that they've been through is coming to an end. And where everything that they've worked for, they will see the rewards. It is finally over. Everything is going to be okay. You see, I think over the generations, I know when I was a teenager, this idea of the harvest is ready was used to try and frighten people into religion. <laughs> Like, if Jesus came now, would you go to heaven or hell? You know, this whole turn or burn concept. It was used like that. So when we think about Jesus coming to harvest the earth, oh my goodness gracious me, please no, not in my generation. But let's think about who Jesus is. Like, like who is Jesus? Jesus is gentle. Jesus is sacrificial. Jesus is loving. Jesus is kind. Jesus is good. Jesus is incredible, and he's the one in control of this harvest. So why would the harvest be something we should fear? It's good news when the harvest happens. N.T. Wright puts it like this. The passage is often read, of course, the other way. Uh, as a story of great and terrifying judgment, with the Son of Man, Jesus himself, executing God's wrath with his sickle, and an angel from heaven gathering up the grapes of wrath, understood as the wicked nations who are about to suffer God's eternal anger. But the harvest imagery and the natural implications it would carry strongly tell against this. Other thing we need to remember is it talks about the flowing of blood. Okay, now you're probably like, okay, that's all good and well, but what about the people that were put in the wine press and blood flowed for 300 kilometers? Like, that's kind of gruesome. When did the Israelites, when did the people that John were reading, uh, that were reading John's letters, uh, when would they see blood flowing out of a city? Passover. Passover was all about this blood that is shed for the forgiveness of sins. The lamb is in control and he shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. We cannot look at the judgment of God without also looking at the sacrifice of Christ. They have to go hand in hand because they are connected. We cannot look at the judgment of God or the wrath of God without looking at the sacrifice of Jesus. They are one in the same thing. So maybe they deserved to be burnt for eternity and face this ever after sulfur. But at the end of the day, when it's harvest time, when Jesus comes eventually, uh, his blood is the one that flows for the sake of the people. Cannot look at the judgment of God without also looking at the sacrifice of Christ. They have to go hand in hand. And when we look at them together, this image of the harvest is pretty good news. It means that finally the destroyer is destroyed and everything is made right. Any thoughts, comments, questions before we carry on? Nothing. Okay. Then it is quarter to seven. So we are going to take a break until 7 o'clock. Um, enjoy your tea and coffee, and I'll see you just now. Okay. Hello. Hey. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we, we're just going to have a few minutes of feedback. 
uh, not feedback as in a noise, as in what do you have to say or think. Um, Charlie has had a discussion with those online, so he's going to share something from the online group. And then just a, a moment, we've, we've covered quite a few bits now. We've covered all three of these different sections, Jesus on Mount Zion, the three angels, and the 144,000, and then the harvest. So before we carry on to our next section, maybe just a, a moment of reflecting. Anybody have anything they'd like to share? Charlie, you, you want to come to the front or not? No, I'm quite capable of standing at the back. That's great. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, just from the online group, um, the one thing that Norman highlighted was in the military, you had dog tags. And your dog tag normally had your name, religion, blood group, sometimes force number, um, and sometimes even medical information. And that was not a branding, but it was particularly so that if in an emergency, whoever could help you and know who to contact and how to go about assisting you uh, as best as possible. Hmm. I like that. Um, also share just the, the significance of the blood flowing, and it's always been a gruesome idea, and yet the idea of the Passover and the blood symbolizing the forgiveness and God's grace and mercy uh, totally put a different uh, spin and perspective for many people on, on that imagery. And um, yeah, just once again, um, it becomes more heartwarming to know that Jesus has one. Um, even in today's time when we're struggling and things are difficult, the end result is that Jesus has won. Mm. The victory is his, and we are victorious in him and through him. And then Norman asked a question around fear. Um, so much of the Bible kind of paints this God of fear, and, and there's so much fear coming through in, in Revelation and, and, and misinterpretation. Um, do you want to share a little bit around fear um, I did share about, in the Old Testament, the word meant more reverence. Um, and through the ages and through translation, we've lost that reverence and kind of adopted fear as the go-to word. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I suppose if I could speak about fear a little bit. I'll never forget, years ago, I was in a conversation with my mentor at that stage. He's a now retired minister. And him and I were having a conversation, and, and he said something that changed my life. He said to me, what is the opposite of faith? And I said, doubt. And he went, no, you can have faith and doubt together. Think about Thomas. Think about the disciples after the resurrection. He says, you can have faith and still doubt. He says, that's not the opposite of faith. He says, the opposite of faith is fear. And I went, I don't understand. And then he unpacked it a little bit. He says, fear... Um, fear is, is, is fear is always about what's to come makes you afraid. So you're afraid of the possible outcomes. So I send my kids, we, we were discussing, so I'm going to use that analogy. Somebody during the tea break was telling me that as a young child of nine or ten, they were running around uh, in the streets of Joburg, CBD, uh, going to the museums on their own, et cetera, et cetera. I think to myself that creates a sense of fear for me. The reason it creates fear is because I imagine what could happen to my children if they go there. So, so fear is this concept that something bad is about to happen. I see a snake, I'm afraid because I think it might bite me, which means I might die. Faith is the opposite of that. Faith is saying, whatever happens, it'll be okay. God is good. God is in control. So, so the opposite of fear is actually faith. And when the first readers of John, when the, the first Christians, the first Jesus followers, they knew that so well because they'd firsthand seen what had happened to Jesus. They saw Jesus face the worst thing that this world could throw at him. And at the end of it, he was okay. He was risen. And suddenly, they lost this fear 
of what people could do to them. And they had this tremendous faith that said, you can do what you like. The end of it, I'll be okay. And so they lost that fear, which meant that the Roman government couldn't control them, which is what made them such a threat. The opposite of faith is fear. Passage that I think of is, there is no fear in perfect love. There is no fear in perfect love. I think, though, over the years, we've read Revelation particularly from a very uh, end-time perspective. So people have read it from, this is a fortune-telling book, that this is telling us what's going to happen. And in the, in the particularly 70s, 80s, 90s, there was a lot of theology that started emerging about this. They made movies on it and wrote books on it on the end time. And it was scary as absolutely anything, this concept that these beasts would take control of the earth and people would face all sorts of things. And some people managed to escape it because they were really, really good. <laughs> and those of us who weren't really, really good got left behind and we had to face all these horrible things. Isn't that how Revelation has been? interpreted over the years. That creates fear, and fear has been a very good tactic to try and get people into heaven because some people are so scared of going to hell <laughs> that they'll do whatever they can to escape it. But that paints God into a very gruesome picture, uh, and the way we look at God is through Jesus, and Jesus is not gruesome. Jesus was loving and kind and glorious and good and faithful and sacrificial. Uh, so we must always interpret Scripture through our understanding of Jesus. And when we look at Revelation from that perspective, suddenly this book isn't about fear, it's about faith. It's about saying you will face torture and pain and suffering and even death and there will be a monstrous government that will rule over the world but don't worry at the end of the day Jesus is on Mount Zion and you will be okay even if you have to die at the end of the day you will be okay so this is actually a book about faith and not about fear but we've interpreted it from a perspective of fear because for so long people have taken it literally and that is scary. <laughs> that is scary. Especially if you think, is it about to happen any minute now? And think about it. I don't know if you've, if you've seen any of these things. Like, just before, can you remember, was it um, Iceland, where that volcano has just erupted? Just before that volcano erupted, people were saying, it's the end of the world. It's going to shut down airspace. It erupted. We're okay. Like, we're Okay. You know, now, now there's that doomsday iceberg, you know, and, and all these things. I'm not saying global warming isn't a real thing, and I'm not saying that was actually what my master's was about. Um, I, I fully agree with it. We are destroying the earth, and there's consequences to destroying the earth, and that's what Revelation has shown us as well. But if we face whatever the future brings with fear, that's not facing it with faith. And Revelation is all about faith. Revelation is saying there can be a monstrous government. There can be a seven-headed beast that tries to overthrow and devour everyone in its like path. Ah, but at the end of the day, you're going to be okay because God is good and God is in control. Um, so, so that's how I see it. There is a little girl at the door. No, I'm serious. Charlie? Oh, hello. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you guys all thought I was getting philosophical. <laughs> like, no, I see a child at the door. Okay, sorry. So that was uh, my response to the question about faith and fear. Anybody here have something that they would like to share? I see there's a hand here. If we could just wait for the microphone, please. I don't know how many people remember that just before the 94 elections and all the rest of it, that a radio company put out a bumper sticker, egg book. Everything's going to be okay. Okay. I don't know if you remember that. I don't, but I'm sure some people might. <laughs> Everything's going to be okay. Hello, Ty. Any other thoughts, comments, questions?
Nobody. Was that, was that analogy of faith and fear helpful? Thank you. Okay, let us move on. We are going to be looking at Revelations chapter 15 from verse 1 through to verse 8. And so we are now moving on, Revelation chapter 15, from verse 1 through to verse 8. After this, so after what is this? This is now having seen the three angels and what they signified, which was that God is still in control after the harvest of the earth. This is what happens. After this, I looked and I saw in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. You thought it was over, didn't you? No. Nope. It's just starting. These seven angels with the seven plagues were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore gold sashes around their, their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. <laughs> Hectic, isn't it? I want us to think back. We have been going at this for quite a few weeks. I can't even remember how many weeks we've been looking at Revelation. Anybody know how many weeks we've done? Anybody? I have no clue. But I want us to try and remember the book of Revelation so far. We are now at chapter 15. We're getting to the end. I want you to try and remember what was the first lot all about? The seven churches. So it opened with the letters to the seven churches. Can you remember that? In other words, it started with John showing everybody this is what's happening on earth. It gave us a very good indication of what the churches were going through in that seven letters to the seven churches. What did we see after that? Anybody remember? Okay, we get in there, seven bowls, seven trumpets, well, seven bowls is coming, seven trumpets, seven seals. So, so here we go. There was the seven churches. It shows us everything that's happening on earth. Okay, that's like the opening of Revelation. After that, what happens is John goes into the throne room. Can you remember the throne room of heaven? He has these visions of what's happening on heaven. So now he's seen what's happened on earth. He has written letters to everybody saying that like, God is still here. God is still in control. This is what you need to be doing as the people of God. And then he has these visions, these dreams that he has gone into the throne room of God. Can you remember that first throne room? It was the one with the, where God looked like all these colors and the rainbows, and there was the sea of glass. Can you remember that? So he's in the throne room. What happens in the throne room is the lamb is given a scroll, and everyone gets excited thinking, oh my gosh, this is good news. And he opens the scroll, and there are seven seals, and every time a seal is opened, there's some kind of catastrophe. <laughs> you remember that? So it was the seven letters that shows what happens, and then they go into the throne room. Then there's the seven seals. What happens after that? They go back to the throne room, and they see what's happening. You think everything's over, and in the throne room, what happens is the angels are given trumpets. <laughs> and so we have the seven trumpets. Every time a trumpet is blown, there's some kind of disaster. What happens at the end of them? We go back to the throne room and we witness the beasts and the glory and we're now at the throne room again. What's going to happen after the throne room is the seven bowls <laughs> or the seven plagues. Do you see what Revelation does? This is John telling a story. It's John, uh, through God's revelation to John, telling the people a story. This is what you're going through on earth. But don't worry, something is happening in heaven. And he keeps reflecting back to that. And he's joining the two. And he's looking at it from different perspectives all the time. Seven plagues, seven trumpets, seven seals. And he's describing what's happening on earth through this lens of this cosmic activity. 
that God has not forgotten them. God is still at work, no matter what they face. And then he goes back to the throne room and then back to what's happening and back to the throne room. Do you see that? It's a pattern. Revelation is a pattern. It's a puzzle. Seven, seven, seven. Do you notice that as well? Everything's always sevens. Seven churches, seven trumpets, seven seals, seven balls. Seven is the perfect number. It is God's number. Do you see the bad things? Uh, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven balls. Not bad things, but the, the yeah, bad. I don't know how to, else to describe it. There's three of them. See that? Three of them. That happens. Seven, God's number. Three, God's number. It's this beautiful pattern that Revelation makes. And so it makes sense that there has to be one more seven to make up the three. And right at the end, I have a suspicion we might go back to earth at the end of Revelation. I don't know yet, so don't quote me on that. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. And so we have the seven angels with the seven seals. What do we know about the seven angels? Uh, the seven angels are we're dressed in white. In other words, they're pure. They have sashes of gold. In other words, they're royalty. They're victorious. Once again, just this image of they're in control. Then we have the sea of glass and fire. Can you remember back to that first throne room experience? Can you remember the sea of glass? Anybody remember that? Uh, when we spoke about the sea of glass there, this is what I wrote. That was, by the way, part two, week one. Feels like a lifetime ago. This is what we said there. The sea of glass. When we think of the sea in terms of biblical description, we imagine the Red Sea they parted for the Israelites to cross over in the time of Moses. That's when the sea is mentioned. We then think later of Revelation, uh, they're told that there will be no sea. We're going to get there. Uh, we think of Jesus calming the waters during the storm. We think of Jonah and the fish and how the people threw Jonah into the sea. But remember the worldview of the people in that time was that Seol, or the underworld, was accessed through the sea. People believed that the sea often acted as God's judgment. Hence, if you were out to sea and a storm hit, it was believed that you were guilty of some kind of sin. That's why when Paul is shipwrecked in the book of Acts, people thought he must be guilty. Uh, until a snake bit him and he didn't die, then they realized he was innocent. <laughs> That's literally how they thought. Likewise, when Jonah was out at sea and a storm rose, the people asked who's guilty on this boat. And the sea calmed when Jonah was thrown into the sea. Uh, to have a sea like glass in front of the throne must be significant. There was a story even in, that was re recorded that somebody had to face trial and they crossed over the ocean and they were on trial for murder. And when they crossed over the ocean and they arrived in Rome, they were declared innocent because there was no storm out at sea, which means that they must be innocent. That's how much they believed it. Like we now look at it and go like, what? <laughs> But that's how much they believed it. They believed that if you were out on the ocean and a storm broke out, you were guilty of something. The sea was considered to be part of the judgment of God. And so we have the sea of glass signifying the judgment of God. But now suddenly that sea is filled with fire. <laughs> it gets better, doesn't it? What does fire represent? Sorry? Judgment, purification, refining, cleansing. So now it's saying that we're getting to the point that things are changing in the throne room for these people. So as things are changing, now the sea of God's judgment is also filled with God's refining. This is the refining moment that the people are going to face. Uh, that's the sea mixed with fire. We then read that those who had been victorious over the beast and his image stand next to the sea. Uh, so we have this group of witnesses. Once again, these victorious warriors who've been martyred. These are people who are constantly uh, seen in the throne room. They're part of everything. Do you see that? From the beginning, there was this crowd. <laughs> Can you remember? From the beginning, every time you go back to the throne room, there's a few things we see. See the sea of glass, the four living creatures, the elders, this crowd, the lamb and God. 
and then angels come in and do all these different things. So once again, we see these people, this crowd, but this time they're singing a song. Uh, they're singing a song, and it's described as the song of Moses. Now, what is the song of Moses? Exodus 15. Anybody know when Moses sang? After the Red Sea. So after they crossed the Red Sea, him and his sister Miriam burst into song. And in Exodus 15, they're described as singing this glorious song of how God overcame everything. And so it's once again signifying that at the end of all of this trials and everything, God overcomes. God is the overcomer. Interesting is that that whole song is made up of Old Testament passages. Great and wonderful are your works, Psalm 95, Psalm 111, Psalm 98, Psalm 139. You've got it in your notes. Every one of those lines that they sang was actually from the Old Testament. Um, which means that for John's first readers, it would have just once again signified this absolute victory. Uh, this victory. Second thing about the song is it doesn't mention anything about their personal achievements. Do you notice that every time they sing these songs, these are martyrs, these are guys that have, have now been declared as faithful, these are people that have gone through all these trials and hardships and they've come out faithful at the end. And when they see God, what do they sing? They sing all about God. They don't sing, oh, we are, we are the champions. <laughs> That's not what they sing. They, they just sing about God. They also don't sing about their sorrows. They don't sing about how much harshness they faced and how much terror they faced. They don't sing about that. They only sing about the glory of God. What does that tell us? It tells us when they face God, the end of the day. Their achievements and their failures mean nothing in the face of God. You cannot brag about what you've done when we truly encounter God. We will realize that there is nothing to brag about. And we also will not harp on where we failed when we encounter God. All that there is to do is just worship him because we'll see God for who God is. All their failures, all their shame, all their hardship, all their successes are never mentioned in their songs in the throne room. I think one of the greatest problems in our world is that we're so focused on ourselves. And that's essentially the root of all evil, is this being so, self, like so focused on ego that we forget about how great God is. Um, H.B. Sweet said it like this, In the presence of God, the martyrs forgot themselves. Their thoughts are absorbed by the new wonders that surround them. The glory of God and the mighty scheme of things in which their own sufferings formed an infinitesimal <laughs> part are opening before them. They begin to see the great issue of the world drama, and we hear the doxology with which they greet the first unclouded vision of God and his works. When we finally see God or encounter God, every suffering, all achievements will be insignificant in comparison to the incredible glory that we encounter. That is good news. That is good news. The third thing about this group, the song, is that it speaks about judgment but with joy and celebration and not fear. I think we, we've touched on that quite a lot tonight. Uh, I just remember when I started my journey um, as a Christ follower, there, there was always a sense of fear and dread attached to the concept of judgment. Now, I don't know if you guys were, like, when I was a teenager, I remember a preacher one day saying, like, everything, this, for a teenager, this is scary stuff. Everything you've ever done will be read out in front of everyone. That is scary. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't want that. Like, you know, that's how people painted the picture of judgment. But we have to look at judgment through the idea of grace and sacrifice and Jesus. 
And here, they don't speak about judgment with fear, but with celebration. They're grateful that the judgment is happening. Are you grateful for the judgment <laughs> to come? When we understand it from the perspective of grace and God's goodness, we will be. Because that's the moment where God puts everything right and the destroyer is destroyed. <laughs> the other thing is I want you to think of it like this. Why would they be grateful for judgment? Imagine a small village. N.T. Wright uses this. I've actually written it down for you in your notes, but you don't have to look at it right now. But I want you to imagine for a minute that there's this small village out in the middle of nowhere. And, and this village has no judge, no lawyers. It's just a tiny little village out in the middle of nowhere. Imagine that only every, let's say, six months, the judge would go to a neighboring town, and then cases could be resolved. A widow gets ripped off by a builder takes everything she owns. She had been saving up to try and build onto her house, fix her roof. The builder comes in, takes everything, all the money that she saved. This has happened to people even here. A builder comes in, takes everything she owns. She now has nothing. She has to wait for six months before she can lay a claim against this guy and get some of her money back. Imagine somebody has attacked someone else and beaten them to a pulp, and now that person uh, can't work and they have to wait six months before they can get some kind of payment and retribution. Uh, do, can you get the picture? Like that six months for the people that have been suffering these injustices must feel like an eternity. And when the judge finally arrives, there must be the sense of like, whew, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Everything will be set right. And that was the sense for the people of John. They've been living as this group of people who've been isolated and tortured and killed and martyred. And now there's a promise. The judgment is coming. And they know that everything will be made right. And so they don't fear it. They celebrate it. Okay. Any Thoughts, comments, questions? Anybody have anything to say? Charlie, will you watch online for us, please? Anything stand out for anyone in this passage, in these passages? I'll give us a few minutes to think. Yeah. So I hope it's come across like what, what I've been trying to do throughout Revelation is, is allow us to see that this is not necessarily a book that tells us the future of the end of the world, but this was a book speaking to people who are facing a moment of crisis. But because it's the Word of God and it's living, it speaks to people in every generation who face moments of crisis. Does that make sense? So somebody we were chatting today uh, during the coffee break, I only enjoy those coffee breaks when, when we have some conversations, and somebody came to me and we were speaking about this concept of, okay, so Rome is Babylon. Uh, what's the modern-day Babylon? Like, who's the world power today that's actually representing the beast? Uh, and we had some interesting discussions, and I'm not going to get into the political ones. Each person can make up their own mind. But I do sometimes think that nobody gets into that much power without following the ways of evil. <laughs> so perhaps every world power in some ways represents the beast. 
Because you cannot be a world power if you follow the way of sacrifice and love and service. <laughs> you can be a world power if you manipulate people into thinking you're doing that, which is what the beast was doing. But you cannot be that powerful without compromising on the values of Christ. The first will be last, the last will be first. So just think about who's the world powers today and wonder where, where is the beast functioning? And, and I think there's more than one. I don't think it's just one. Over here. Uh, if we could just wait for the mic, sorry. I think also we should not only be looking at countries, okay? Because there are... Uh, kind of uh, formations out there. Mm. Uh, there's uh, big business, there's conglomer conglomerates eh? uh, who are more powerful than governments because mm. they hold the governments uh, ransom. To, to ransom. <laughs> no, thank you. I appreciate that. I even wonder if there aren't, now I'm, I'm going to go a little bit, maybe I should have thought this through before I say something, but I, I even wonder if in organizations there aren't beasts. <laughs> there are. So I wonder if in church organizations there aren't beasts who are functioning like people of the light, but when it's all about power, uh, is it really from Christ? You know, like, and it's about realizing that, you know what, no matter how much power somebody or a group of people or a business or a company or an organization has, at the end of the day, Babylon will fall. At the end of the day, Babylon will fall. It will never last forever. It cannot. Uh, even in South Africa, our Babylon will fall. And I'm not saying that it's anything specific, but all of this, all of this, um, all the evil, all the injustice, those things will come to an end at some point. And our job is not to judge. It's not to decide the punishment. Our job is to just faithfully endure whatever the beasts are throwing at us. That's a difficult one to swallow, though, hey? It's a difficult one to swallow. Any other thoughts, comments, before we close? Charlie, anything from you? Great. A little bit of a um, way forward is next week we will start by looking at the seven plagues, the seven bowls, and what happens as each one gets unleashed. And so that's what we're going to be doing next week. We will have one more week after that, and then we'll finish part three. We'll take one week's break, where I will be taking the weekend off, <laughs> and then we will get back and finish Revelation with another two-week series. So we've got, how many is that, four weeks left, with a break in between, so five weeks, and within the next five weeks, we will be finishing uh, the book of Revelation. So let's look forward to how it ends. Every week I think, oh, I know what's going to happen, and then something new happens. So thank you. Let us close in a word of prayer. Charlie, will you pray for us, please? Gracious Lord, we thank you once again for this opportunity to meet together, to gather together, to share together, and to learn. We are truly blessed by the insights that we have received and we are reminded of, just again, your love, your grace and the outpouring of your Spirit upon us. May we not look at, at the Scriptures with fear but with a sense of hope and a sense of anticipation because, Lord God, we know that you are doing something, and we look forward to seeing what unfolds. Help us to remain faithful. Help us to remain steadfast. Guide us and strengthen us. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.